This was obviously requested because you guys know how much we love checking it on Trisha, wishing her the best. It's never easy being a person. So let's see how she does on Rain Wilson's soul boom. Now, I don't know. You haven't, do you have any experience being on camera at all? <laughs> I do a podcast, being... <laughs> but not like on camera like you. I mean, I'm not like kidding. you. Okay. <laughs> let's reframe this a little bit. You know how people are like, is Trisha autistic? You know, that's definitely a question all the borderline girlies should ask themselves. That's definitely a question we should all ask ourselves because she just took that question so literally. We love that. Like most of your journey has been a mental health journey. So what you're describing is like there's kind of imbalance and there's been some trauma, obviously. There's some drug abuse and addiction stuff and some a little dose of narcissism thrown in oh, and then for sure. and then you get these these modern tools like like YouTube and MySpace and Twitch and and streaming and all the social media stuff and it's it's a it's a it is it's a fascinating cocktail but the the thing I want to just bring out is that I also really admire you and have gotten to really kind of know you and watching your videos and and reading about you and preparing for this interview how um, just unabashedly raw you are about sharing uh, your ups and downs. And I, I feel like that has been so helpful to really millions of people that have followed your journey. You get a lot of backlash, of course, but you're unafraid to be completely vulnerable and to talk about the journey. But I would love for you to talk a little bit more specifically about kind of a blow by blow going through this mental health journey and documenting it uh, in such a fascinating, in-your-face way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. It is, you know, it is a blessing at this point because I think I found, like, my stability in life. So I feel like now at least I could show the happy ending. I think it could have ended, like, badly. Right. Um, in which case— Yeah, it would be a very different story. If, mm, yeah. Which— I also romanticize, like, so I always thought, like, oh, I'll die before I'm 30. Like, I just, like, right, romanticized it, like, Anna Nicole. You know, like, those kind of people were the people I related to. Okay, I pause. Uh, so obviously we're not just going to watch this to watch it. We're going to talk about it. Think about the people she idealized. So we know there's a lot of parallels between me and Trisha in a, in a way, like just that's why we watch content creators. Cause we relate to some extent, like, um, though I don't, you guys know, I don't watch her religiously now. I just mostly want to check up on her. We're both in our thirties. We're both borderline. We'll see what that's about since it's a construct. And then there's, um, overlap with romanticization of unaliving i've attempted i think she's attempted right like this idea like we're gonna die i never romanticized dying young like oh the 27 club and i never liked anna nicole smith or related to that at all like i'm not into the bimbo bubble like that's not my i don't relate to that i'm more in the um, even more cringe neurodivergent vampire shakespeare bubble where it's like ophelia like dying and the hamlet and like Romeo and Juliet and like tragic love stories or tragic stories or the mad writer who writes a manifesto in a forest about the meaning of purpose and then like unalives in a great artistic way like or somebody who just feels like lonely and like doesn't know their place in the universe. I'm in that bubble. And it's interesting that Trisha relates to the Anna Nicole Smiths because Trisha centered her life around men. And I and I think I fell into the different category, which is like I centered my life around the art which is so interesting because Trisha's such a theater kid. Like, I think that's so interesting that Trisha is such a theater kid. And yet she centered her life sort of on relationships, which is so interesting. I just love how journeys are so different. I was like, you know what? If I end early, like, at least I'll be like legendary or something. You know, like that was the thoughts in my head. Of course, now I have children and I want to live to be like 100. But um, yeah, I just, again, it was kind of, maybe more like the narcissism and the money of just like, I'm just going to document this. This is how I am. I'm a mess. Like, at least I can make money this way because I could never hold like a standard job. I mm. tried and I just like couldn't. Before I made money on YouTube, I did stripping. I did escorting. I did all that stuff. And it was just my only option. So then when I saw on YouTube, I could make... I'm going to say this out loud too. And I think this is only to pay attention to bubbles, not to discredit Trisha. I, as somebody who knows like full service, no, like escorts, there are people who did stripping for two months and they're like, I was a stripper. And then people who did it for five years. And I never know what Trisha's story is. Did she do it like 
literally in the business for X amount of time actually ran the, or did she try it once or twice? And she's like, I didn't like it because my brain kind of says, oh, I did that once, but I don't identify as the thing if I only did it once. I kind of have this thing where I have to do it for a certain amount of time before I qualify it as like the thing that I was. Because I think when you're in the lifestyle, when you do it for a really long time, like I don't think people who engage in casual kink know what the BDSM community is. And I don't think people who go to a Diddy party know what the BDSM community is. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I I do always wonder when people tell me their stories, what are they saying? Now, for the record, you could sensationalize your life enough to tell a story like, oh, I was a stripper. Oh yeah, I was an escort. But like, were you or did you just do it once or twice? Because for some people, that's all it takes is one time you kiss a guy, you're gay. For other people, it's like, okay, like straight men can kiss other men. You're not gay. Relax. So it's kind of interesting when we have conversations about like, you know, when you have this conversation about this is what I did. This is what I did to survive. I always want to know like, but tell me the story. What were the details? I never know with Trisha. What are the actual details of the story? You know? Yeah, I always wonder. Money, doing the same thing and just showing myself like completely like, like just plastered or disassociating or whatever. Like, and I thought, so I did it unintentionally. It wasn't my intention to be like, look at like this, because I didn't know I had mental illness. I really didn't um, until much later. And so it was untreated. I think people can like live with mental illness, which is what I'm living with, but mine was untreated for so long. And because I was getting rewarded like through YouTube and money, I was like kept going with it mm-hmm. until I realized it was like, okay, yeah. like I can't do it anymore. What were the symptoms of your mental illness? How did it manifest? Um, well, at first it was just, you know, I, I attribute a lot of it to like abusing like prescription pills. So I thought, well, maybe it's like when I'm using this, it's just, I'm a little unhinged. But then when I wasn't, um, it was 2019. I also shout out to the makeup artist or her, whoever did the makeup, her eyeshadow perfectly matches her shirt. I don't know. I just like something happened where I, I got 5150. I had just gone through a breakup and I. What's 5150? For like, those who don't know. Oh, it's like a involuntary hold. So okay. like in California. Danger you, to itself or others. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. So, you know, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. I know. So, yeah. <laughs> Some of our viewers may not. <laughs> okay. Right. So I got 5153 times that year. And the first was, yeah, I just, I just remember waking up in like Cedar sinai and my. Ex- Okay, I want to ask, how do I ask these questions without people think like, look, everyone's going to cover this differently. I just have a question. Does Trisha think this is cool or does Trisha think this is bad? Does she think it's like braggable or like makes her story more interesting? Is she, because if she, Anna Nicole Smith and all these people, like they have very specific kinds of lives. And I always wonder this now that I, you know, review Julia Fox's book, like Julia Fox is like bragging in her memoir, that her life went the way it was and she feels like she she was the best of the worst type thing. So I always wonder about that. Like, does she think it makes her interesting? Does she think it makes her deep? Is this a bad thing? And then what does it mean when like this was your lived story? Like, does it make her mental health relationship more valid because it was harder? Do you guys ever run into this where people like, oh, you're not disabled, you're not sick, you're not mentally ill, like your life wasn't hard enough. But then if you're Trisha, now you can never be trusted because you were too sick. And I don't think that's very valid. Like, I think Trisha's experience was real. I do think she was merely messed up and that's why she was willing to do the things she did online. I don't think she was ever Gabby or Fousey. I think they're in a totally different realm of like mentally unwell. And none of them are evil people who deserve to be like treated badly. But it is kind of interesting that Trisha did this amazing thing of getting her life back on track in such a real way. And look, without a doubt, she suffered. And without a doubt, she overcame. I really think she did a lot of good. I think she's still on this very big healing journey. But it is kind of interesting uh, how people tell their stories, I think. Discord says early Trisha was so interesting to observe. I remember her making videos about being Christian, but stripping and having plastic surgery. I still don't know how much was true and exaggerated or versus exaggerated. I pieced out when it turned into more crying breakdowns. Yeah, I never watched Trisha like religiously. I only watch clips. I'm not, I have to be honest with you. I don't like watching dysfunction. I don't take joy. I'm not happy. So like I can always only handle a certain level of dysfunction. I can't handle lots of it. So even with reality TV, if it's too dysfunctional, I can't watch it. But if it's just the right amount of like healthy, reasonable and like dysfunction, I can watch it. And Trisha was always too dysfunctional for me. But 
at the same time, I love an underdog story. So Trisha, without a doubt, has recovered in a way that is so significant from Trisha 10 years ago. She deserves all her roses for doing DBT and doing the work. And I think that's what's really beautiful. I don't know how healed she is. I don't know the details of her life. I don't know what she's thinking from what she's expressed in snippets that I've seen. She's still on a journey of understanding and having a good relationship with herself, which is so valid. We're always on that journey. It's just different layers of the of the journey, you know? Ex-boyfriend at the time was there and then someone I was filming with at the time was there and they were like filming, like they had their camera and stuff. And I just lost it. I ran through Cedar Sinai. They shot me with like Ativan and I just like couldn't calm down. And so that was like the first time it happened went to the mental hospital. So I have borderline personality disorder, which is more of like a uh, like a personality disorder. And I can't, I had trouble like regulating my emotions. I had, um, I thought relationships were more intense than they were. I would like have like these fantasies, but also like I would disassociate at the same time. So there was like delusion, there was dissociation, there was like a lot happening. Um, and yeah, I think I think it wasn't until then that I saw a therapist who was like, oh, this might be something you have, which then they referred me to DBT classes, which is, um, it's like a group therapy for people with borderline. Dialectical behavior yeah, therapy. Yeah, yeah. And how did, how did that help specifically? Oh, it helped. Is that what helped turn the corner? Yes. So, so what about it specifically? I like the group aspect of it. I was always someone that like- That is so interesting. I love DBT. I, I really changed the trajectory of my whole life, but I did solo DBT one-on-one -on -one with my therapist. I didn't do group. I don't like group projects. I don't want to talk to any of you. I didn't even like it when my therapist was on vacation and I had to talk to somebody else, but I do love DBT. It really changed my whole trajectory. Like without it, I don't think, I think there was one of the main tools I was missing to change my life. So I'm glad that I came across it. And it was not easy to find a therapist, by the way. Like, just wanted private therapy, or actually I wasn't doing any therapy up until 2019, but I love the group aspect of just like hearing other people like share like what I was going through because I didn't know what splitting was. I didn't know what disassociating was. And I was what like, it, oh. What is splitting and disassociating? Tell us. So like disassociating, like just like, you almost like black out. There'd be times when I couldn't even remember, like people would tell me what happened. I'm like, I just don't remember that happening because I would totally black out almost. And I guess I did it since a child, like childhood. When you ask me about childhood, so much of that I just disassociated from where it's like, I don't remember. It's kind of a blur, like memories, but like, I just don't remember a lot of it. Um, and same thing splitting. It's like all or nothing, right? It's like, you know, I'm obsessed with someone or I completely hate someone. And I like just, I can just turn like in an instant, like it's a different person. So I thought, did I have multiple personality disorder? Did I have all this? Um, so when I went to the group therapy classes, they really taught you the skills on, for me, it's breathing, which now, and later on, I had another rock bottom in 2021. But for me, it's like kind of like med my meditation now. But in, in DBT, they call it wise mind, which is like, you know, just really like counting the spaces in between breaths, which is basically for me, like meditation. So show us wise mind right now. Can you demonstrate? Ooh, 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 ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Uh, uh, no, that feels so personal. Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, I would give that's like the most that's so overwhelming for me. I don't like that. So it would be like, yeah, if I was getting overwhelmed, right? And I want to like snap on someone like, and this just works for me, not for everybody, but it really was like taking the breaths, right? You just go, you like count and then you see the spaces in between and you just count, you either see the spaces or you count the breaths. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, and like an exhale. So it's like, and then just like watching the spaces pass as I've gotten into like meditation. Sometimes I see like clouds passing or my problems passing or just kind mm -hmm. of like taking a moment, which I don't think I ever did. I was very quick to react, which is why all my videos online are me just like really angry and aggressively reacting to anyone who said anything about me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is mm -hmm. scary for people. It's scary for people in real life. Cause I was, I was snapping on my people in real life and I'm like, this is just who I am. Like, this is just what it is. Were you sober at that point in time? Yeah. Because I wouldn't say I was ever like addicted. I said I would, I would use when I was around people who would use. So if someone was like, that was the year of my meth. Right. But like I, Xanax, all this stuff like that. So I was sober. Um, and I think that helped a lot. I was also like very alone and I just never did good alone. So with the group, I just felt like I had people to talk to mm -hmm. where very basic things like, you know, get sleep, socialize, like get some exercise, that kind of stuff. So that was like my socializing because I didn't have people in my life, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and that's why I liked it. I, it really, really helped me. 
you've shared a lot about, you know. You know, I really do think that's such a good point Trisha made. So many people get into substance use because it's a socializing tool. I was just talking to one of my siblings about this, like how there is that pressure to sort of like drink, to feel comfortable doing things you wouldn't want to do sober, almost to give yourself like an excuse. And it really does encourage like a really, like a big dependence on needing a substance to socialize. And again, we're in a world where it's like, why don't I have real friends? Well, if you're only friends with these people because they dr you drink with them, I mean, there's some validity in that. But also think about that. And drinking has so many more, I think, like um, consequences than we give it credit for sometimes. And I'm excited that Gen Z is drinking less. There's something really hopeful in that, I think. And also it's expensive. But I think there is something hopeful in that. Like I'm really – I'm – I just, yeah, I, I think that's so interesting, the need to have a substance in order to have friends. You know, using pills, using sex, mm -hmm. seeking fame, the ups and downs of that. What was your lowest point and what sought you to- This is a weird interview. I can see why people didn't love it, but I can also see why it's weird. It's like, we're going right to the hard stuff and there's no like- uh, which I totally get. Like, sometimes I like to just jump right in. But I guess... Oh, this is... Okay, no, no, no. I take it back. Actually, the title is The Mental Toll of Living Online. I guess I guess that kind of coincides. I just... I'm trying to think if I didn't know Trisha, would this be a weird interview? So, okay, it's fine. Yeah. Like, if you didn't know Trisha, this would be a weird introduction to her. But also, I guess that makes sense. So, okay. Okay. I like the questions, by the way. The questions are great. I just feel like, oh... There was like no buffer. We just jumped in. Great. Hey, people said that with Abba and me when Abba and I did my interview. I just jumped right into him. So, you know, maybe it's just that weird thing where we just like want to jump in. Kind of seek perhaps a spiritual path out of what you were uh, experiencing. I've had a couple. Wait, I'm going to have to rewind it because I didn't get the question. And what sought you to kind of seek perhaps a spiritual path out of what you were uh, experiencing? I've had a couple, couple low points. 2007, 2019, I had two overdoses that landed me in the hospital, but it actually was 2021 when I had like an actual psychotic break where I was like, Ooh, like nothing's working. Cause 2021, I, what does Trisha mean when she says I had a psychotic break, right? Like what does Trisha mean when she says that? Because I don't know what people mean when they say, what do you, what do you guys think people mean when they say it? Because in my head, a psychotic break would be like psychosis, like something like a complete, like inability to have like a grounding to some extent. Like I always think of a psychotic break as like, like lost, like completely lost out of reality in a really specific way. Like, I've never had a psychotic break, right? So I'm not sure what she means, right? Hospitalized or splitting, probably. She gets wild or unable to control her emotions. Is that a psychotic break, though? Like, that doesn't, that feels like not the right terminology. I think she means just the lowest viewpoint, her view of her point living. Oh, gosh. All right. Yeah, okay. I used to use that descriptor for myself before I realized it was autistic meltdowns, actually. Hey, you know, that's what I mean. Words are so interesting because I think words give, like I'm, and maybe this is my neurodivergence. I want it to be, I want to be very careful with my words because they mean completely different things. Like words really mean things when we can, when we're saying them, they, they're constructs. But when I hear psychotic break, I agree with ultraviolet here, complete loss of touch with reality. And the reason you guys probably know this. I had two therapists, right? The first one didn't said I didn't have borderline. The second one said I had borderline. And it was because they were debating disassociation and how many of the things I had. I never forgot what was happening. Even when I feel like I experienced disassociation from my understanding of it, I'm in the back of my head watching, which could just be a trigger, which maybe isn't even disassociation. Like borderline might've been the wrong diagnosis, but DBT was the right kind of therapy. I've never had a psychotic break. I've never disassociated like that. I've never forgotten what's happening. Like it was, it's interesting when we're having words and what they mean to give you the right diagnosis, but you know what? And I told my friend this when they were like, you don't have DB or borderline Brittany. I was like, it doesn't matter. The DBT saved my life. And I still agree with that. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The therapy was right. Even if the diagnosis maybe wasn't, but I don't know because I'm not sure what these words mean when people say it. 
I'm not sure what these things mean. That's why my therapist was like, you still hold down a job. You still do all these things. And I was like, yes. And I was like very responsible. So I don't know. It's not to say that Trisha wasn't responsible, but obviously my level of dysfunction wasn't to her level. And so then I always do question like, why is that? Is it because of my family background? Like, I want to know why did I have this different experience with this diagnosis that I can't tell if Trisha really had a lot of these experiences because she seems so functional in so many ways. But I can't remember. You know, I've never been hospitalized. I've never like done anything. I've always like, I don't know. I just like, I'm just trying to figure out like why, how do we share a diagnosis and have a completely different relationship with it? But then a lot of the borderline girlies I meet end up being autistic. So now I'm like, oh my God, am I about to be another one of those borderline girls that's actually just autistic? We'll know this fall. Like, but then that doesn't make sense. And then like, that's confusing. And all of this is a construct. So we're still figuring it out. And then the stigma that comes along with it is so intense that I feel like we have to talk about that as well. Isn't that? Humans are so interesting. Okay, this is a great conversation. I'm glad Trisha's sharing. It forces us to have good conversations about ourselves. Done the therapy. I've done the DBT. I thought I had everything under control. But, you know, there was just like one event online, um, like sort of like a cancellation. And I've been through so many, but there was one specific cancellation that like, what honestly- happened? It's like traumatic. I don't, I've never talked about it. Like oh. it's, it's online. I think if people know that. What is it? What is it? Is it frenemies? Is she talking about frenemies? I know, but it's actually, and a lot of it was. Can you talk about it here? Um, is this a safe space? <laughs> it is, but I don't know if the internet's a safe space. Like I. Fire, fire quote right there. This is a safe space, but I don't know if the internet's a safe space. Fire quote, Trisha, good boundaries. It, because you know what? Because it is still so fresh, right? Like it's a few years ago. A lot of it was brought on by me. I would say like 90% of it was definitely brought on by me because I just, I couldn't handle the triggers that I was able to. There was just a situation I was in that triggered me a lot. And it, I'm putting it all on me and like not on anyone else. Like it triggered me so much. And I thought I was like strong enough to like handle these triggers, but it just, it didn't work. So I had a psychotic break in September of 2021. What happened? I went online, there's, it's deleted now. I just went on Twitter, it wasn't even YouTube. And I just was like screaming, sobbing. Like I couldn't control myself. Like I couldn't breathe. Just like shouting at people to like leave and me alone. And let me just pause you yeah. right there. What is it about you? And I'm just really trying to understand <laughs> yeah. this. Like I, I'm, I'm so activated. I'm so angry. I'm so triggered. I'm so overwhelmed. I'm about to just lose my shit. I'm gonna have a psychotic break. Yeah. But I gotta log in yeah. and hit live stream <laughs> and put it in the yeah. tripod and press it and make sure my life. Hey, it's a it's a good question. It's on, and now I'm gonna have the psychotic break. Well, the what lights is, weren't what, on. What okay? What is what's the deal with that though? What is that mm. impulse? And again, is it because you're getting that reward from doing it? The more that you have right. kind of nervous breakdowns online, then you get you know, yeah. the money truck backs up or what? I think in the past it would have been, but this was the reason I mentioned Twitter is because like you couldn't monetize Twitter back then. So I remember putting it because to me it was like, like I said, I've been canceled. I've been in so many feuds. Again, a lot of my doing. And I was what, Liz, drama. Hey, well, I'm going to slow you down <laughs> Please, here because I, I want to get, there's a lot of big generalizations. I don't want to get like real more specific. Like Yeah. The one thing I've never talked about and I, because I've healed so much because it was literally like, and this sounds so silly because it's like, I've been through like, like literally sexual assault when I was a kid by like teachers, like crazy shit. But this like one event, I don't know. It's just something I haven't processed or worked through quite yet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. because it took years for me to like fully get through it and maybe I'm not even fully get through it. Otherwise I could talk about it. Um, again, I think people like if they know, they know. And it's it's all, I put, I put the blame on me because I couldn't handle the triggers. But in answer to your question of like why film it, right? Is because I feel like when you feel like the whole world is against you, you want people to see the pain. But then people can say, this is manipulative. This isn't real. But I was in so much pain that I just mm. wanted people to be like, look, I'm breaking down. Like, I I quit. I'm surrendering. Please stop talking about me. Like, I'm done. Like, And that's what I wanted people to see. But it backfires, right? Because obviously in the storm of cancellation, people are like, you're being manipulative. This is fake. Fake tears. Which kind of makes it worse for the person than going through it, right? Like, it was real. But for me, I just felt like if people could see the hurt, like, mm. cause I used to do that to like boyfriends to anyone. Like I want- Sure, I believe her. I, I believe her. I used to post videos when I was like my saddest and I'd be crying. I had my own crying video stage online. I took them all down. And um, 
that is why I think I have borderline because if you watch those videos, I'm like, that's borderline, right? But it could just be a lot of things. And it was always like related to rejection. So I was like, oh, that could be it. Like not, not rejection from people, but rejection of knowing your place in the universe. And I was like, maybe this is it. And then, uh, it is that where you're like, maybe I'll connect with people. It's like a, it's a, it is a cry for help. Like, you know, when people say like, you're doing this for attention. Yes. Good job, Einstein. You are doing it for attention, but there's like, that's the cry for help. The cry for help is that you're asking for attention. That's why people think it's icky because they're like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. Like a normal person, a healthy person, an average, like they wouldn't do this. I know. That's why I look at Trisha and I look at like even what I'm willing to do or what other people are willing to do. And I gauge where the dysfunction is because a well-adjusted person doesn't do X, Y, Z. A well-adjusted person doesn't get in Twitter fights with their ex and like post things on the internet to get back at them. That's not what they're doing. So again, you know, there's, there's some variations of that, that, you know, has a place that's allowed, but Trisha, it's interesting that she's avoiding the frenemies conversation, probably because Ethan would have to cover it. Some people didn't want Ethan to cover this at all because they thought it would be too mean. And somewhat of that I think is correct. I think Ethan should probably like let her have a moment, but also it's interesting that that's the thing that Trisha hasn't healed from. Ethan really was the only real thing in her life, apparently. Like, that's what it feels like she's saying, you know? Hmm. Wanted them to see that I was actually in pain, but it kind of backfires, so it doesn't really work that way, which now I haven't cried or had a breakdown online since then, and I'm so happy. And Oh my God, shout out. Thank you, Techno says, I had started watching you for your BDSM content, but I remember seeing one of your most recent BPD videos and really feeling so much more connected to you. So thank you for sharing that, Pass Brit. I mean, shout out, ma'am. And I do, I'm okay with the diagnosis. I think it was the right diagnosis in a sense. I just, it's weird when you have like such a different experience than somebody else and you feel like, am I f faking it? Like, do they diagnose me wrong? Or is it just that it really shows up so differently in all of us? And the only ones that are, in some ways, like the most believable are the ones like the Trisha's. Maybe BPD isn't believable until, but then, you know, you don't want to get punished for it. Trisha should not be punished for being sick. She shouldn't be punished for having BPD. She shouldn't be punished for, for being sad. And I think that's why a lot of people give her so many chances to recover because they could see like a well-adjusted person isn't doing this. She's not just a troll even though she was a lol cow, but see lol cows on the internet are deeply sick people at the end of the day. Like, Boogie's a deeply sick person. But I'm so glad to see Trisha recover. Can you imagine a world where Boogie recovers? Trisha is more recovered, but she's still on the journey. But And we're always on the journey. But Boogie isn't even in the recovery state. He's still the, eating the... He still thinks he's a chicken nugget and he's crying on his kitchen floor. Shout out to a Trisha reference. You know? Much prouder for Three that. Three years without a gigantic online breakdown. Congratulations. I mean, not the okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, it's a big feat for you someone like me. Feel free to have one here, though. That would be. <laughs> and you know what? And it, it does. Actually, wait, that's a good point. I think people punish her for her chronic lying. I also don't like Trisha for this reason. One of the reasons I can't watch Trisha is I don't believe anything she says because she's hyperbolic or she says it exaggerated. Like when she's like, oh my God, I was kidnapped. I. I'm too particular about word usage because I'm just so used to people in the world wanting extra attention for the wrong reasons, like unhealthy reasons, that it's hard for me to feel compassion towards a person that's lying. And so my brain like can't handle it. So I also can't watch Trisha for this reason. I just, I just never know what's true. Right. So when she says things like, oh my God, I was kidnapped at parties because I would like fall asleep in the back of cars and people would drive me around. I'm like, okay, hold on. Like, there are truly kidnapped people in the world. So I need to know which one it was. But also I don't want to negate that there could be a version of kidnapping that could be legit. And I don't want to take that away from her either. You know what I mean? I think that's what's so complicated is like I don't want to be another person who adds to a voice where I disregard a victim's story because it doesn't fit a narrative. But I also don't want to waste spoons on a person that is telling the story in a way she remembers but isn't honest. I don't know. You know, I just feel like that. Like, I don't know you, but I'm like, I can talk to you. You understand. Like, I just feel. Yeah. But yeah, um, I think because I've done so well of just like not talking about it because I just never want to come across as like a victim or poor me because like in this situation, like I really don't think. See, that's the thing. When you come across as a victim, look, you either are a victim or you're not. But people who will not believe you won't believe you. So let's f all those people because we believe victims. But we also know people lie. And that's just the life we live in. 
So are you lying or are you a victim? Or are you both? Trisha is definitely a victim, victim of her parenting, victim of her life, victim of her everything. And she's a victim of her own actions. But more than that, I just, it, that's why being the boy who cried wolf is so hard. Ask Usopp. It's very difficult, you know, but like, what is the lying? You know, what is the part that's true? Like she says, I don't want to play a victim, but I'm going to on the call her daddy podcast, say that I was kidnapped. And it's like, that's where, that's where people who use that terminology, that's what they're talking about. They're like, are you actually kidnapped? Are you playing victim to get the views? Because call her daddy, use that as the clip for the promo. Trisha Paytas was kidnapped. Trisha was kidnapped? When? And then when she retells the story, it's like, I can't tell if you're downplaying it or if it actually happened. And that's where it gets really confusing. You know? And then even allegedly, like, she brings up the story of her teacher. Allegedly, some people are saying that was never true and that, you know, footage came out and the family came out and talked about it and, like, or not footage, but, like, dad, like, emails or something. I don't know if that's true. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm rooting for Trisha to heal because at the end of the day, that's all we can do. I think I was. It just was like a lot for me to handle at once. And for some reason, I couldn't psychologically handle it back then. So psychotic break, 21, cancellation, everything. And what happened then? I mm -hmm. love to hear the stories of like Phoenix from the ashes, mm -hmm. like your lowest mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. where you were at and what handholds you found to get yourself out of it. Because mm -hmm. ultimately at Soul Boom, we're looking for spiritual tools yes. to help us in our personal transformation and societal transformation. So I love that. This psychotic breakdown I should also mention was very different than anything else I have experienced in the sense that I was like hearing voices during this era, right? From 2020 to like 2021 when I was getting triggered a lot. And it's something I should have shut down. I definitely should have shut down like anybody triggering me, but I, I just, I don't know. You know, I just play along with it because for so long in my life, I'm like, this is what makes money. This is so I think I was already conditioned to be like, well, triggers are funny. And when I get triggered, people like it. And then people do like it until they don't. Right. And then they're like, mm, this is yeah, too weird. That's such a weird, self-fulfilling like mm. circle, you know, snake eating its own tail of yeah. like, you know, uh, oh, everyone looking at me causes me a breakdown and I get canceled. But when I break down, then I make money and I get even more attention and more people are looking at me. And then that makes me have another breakdown like it. It's uh it's a, it's a, I, I feel like that's what's happening to America. I yeah. feel like you're America right now. Oh, wow. I don't know how I feel about that, but maybe, yeah. maybe it's accurate. Okay. Hopefully that means America is going to heal soon because I'm on a healing journey. You're on so. a healing journey <laughs> and we need to get America on a healing journey. We might. I think this is the year. I don't, I, I will say I would have a hard time being on this podcast with the way my brain works because rain feels a little hokey, like a little too in the spiritual bubble for me where I'm like, relax, bro. All right, you're the universe experiencing itself, but also relax. It's not that deep. <laughs> like, it's you're a little sensationalizing spiritualism, and I don't like that feeling. But um, I think that's the world. I think this idea that the world is the most unhealed it's ever been. Guys, relax. Read about the Roman Empire and then tell me that we're not doing better, okay? Like, at the end of the day, you know... Um, the world is doing better than it's ever been, but also this is life experiencing itself. Worrying about saving the world is the opposite of letting go of attachment, okay? Let it go and do your best yourself. Start with yourself. Chess says, do you think she'd be on this healing journey if she didn't have kids? You know, who knows? I don't know. She um, credits Moses for a lot of her recovery. I don't know if that's accurate either. I don't know. I don't, nobody could know where Trisha would have been. Nobody could predict the future. I don't know. Who knows what would have been the thing? I think she said that DBT really was the thing, though. Right? She said she got on the healing journey because of DBT. And I think that's probably, I mean, relatable. That's the same for me. It was DBT that really got me there. Not family, not friends. My life changed because I got the right therapy for how my brain works. That's what changed my life, really. And then, of course, not just that singular thing. It's never one thing. Just to say it out loud for new people in my audience. Nothing in your life happens because of one person, one thing, one moment. It's not like that. Life is just a bunch of moments all brought into one moment, but like it's not ever one moment. Right? Something will switch hopefully for everybody. Hopefully I it's hope. not 2020. Uh, yeah. I, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> um, but but yeah. continue. So you're, you're at that this low point, mm -hmm. cancellation, documenting this, but voices. Wait, is that true that the DBT happened years before the 2021 breakdown? Is that true? Didn't she do DBT after? If that's true, then maybe, I don't know. <sighs> yeah, I'm not sure. 
is what's up? What's yeah, up? I was, I really thought like schizophrenia or something. Like I really thought I was developing this like later in life. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Cause I was hearing voices, which some people would call them like intrusive thoughts, I guess. But mine were like actual voices where I'm like talking to the person in the room with me. You know what I mean? So see, that's so fascinating. I've never experienced that either. Like I've never had that happen. Um, like my friend who went through psychosis had a psychotic break, obviously they were in psychosis. They heard voices. They saw things that weren't there. They had full blown conversations. They thought like they could hear people from far distances. They thought they could read minds, but they were obviously, they were sick and we all knew it. So not a big deal. Like we could help our friend cause we knew she was sick and that's like reasonable. But with this, like does, does borderline cause a voice it like literal voices, like, that's interesting. My intrusive thoughts are more like my own voice just, like, moving past. Like, you know when you, ha you have a thought in your head, like, boop 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 Or, like, my butt itches. You're like, okay. Like, my thoughts are more like, jump off the cliff. And I'm like, don't tell me what to do, brain. Or they're like, hey, what would it be like to fly off this building? And I'm like, great question. We're not doing it. Or, like, my brain is like, it's like, it comes in. Or, like, my brain is like, your body sucks. Why do you even have it? You should just give up. Don't go to work today. Don't stream. Who needs to stream? They don't even like you. Don't go to don't go to work. And I'm like, shut up, girl. We're talking about Trisha. I got to go to work today. Let me tell you. So like, I don't have like, it's just like thoughts, like thoughts. And I, I have an inner monologue, obviously. So some brains don't have that. And so maybe it's that. I don't know. Let's see. Some people can have psychotic breaks with BPD. I have a friend that had visual auditory hallucinations during an episode, but obviously not all people with BPD. Okay, fair. When I get very stressed, I do think I hear my name being called. I do think I see Indiana Jones often when it's not her. Like I do see these like little black images in the corner of my eye, but I just think it's Indiana and I'm like, Mam -mam and then it's not her. And I'm like, my bad. But like, I think that's, um, I read it was like a trauma response from like, life that you're like always on edge and looking for like the next person maybe i don't know i don't know the difference between intrusive thoughts and what i was feeling because i felt like there was people and i was talking to them in the room so it was definitely scary i definitely um i went to a doctor they like you're not schizophrenic but i was able to obtain schizophrenic medication from mm. someone else so i was like taking that which probably wasn't helping because you got black market schizo medication yes so yes <laughs> So I did was. You, did you run that by anybody? Or no. You just kind of like. <laughs> no, okay. I went just full on. You don't point. usually run stuff by people, right? You just kind of. <laughs> now like, I do. I do okay. have a few people I put things through before I blast it on the internet. Right. right. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I did get some black market, but I. Um, so this one was just more, more intense. And then when I had the actual psychotic break, like this is when I'm full on like. I checked myself in. I don't. I don't know if I talked about this, but it was not a big deal. Like I checked myself into more of like a retreat. Like a. Yeah. I don't, don't want to say it, but there's like a really nice one that you can like check into, and it's more of just like a break. They kind of like take your phone and you kind of just like a break from social media, which is kind of all I needed. And kind of when I am to in my head now, I just like kind of like don't look at my phone for a couple of days and actually so it's, helps. <laughs> it's kind of a social media rehab. Yeah, kind of like kind of. instead of putting away the drugs and alcohol, they put away your phone. Kind of. Like oh wait, hold on. Chat says a little late, but the break in 2021 was because Moses was accused of assaulting and creeping on multiple women. Okay, because that did happen. First, I, the timeline is so muddled for me now. She did the dating show. The Moses and her got together before the show was over. Then that came out. But then they did Frenemies anyways after, right? Oh, so 2021 wasn't Frenemies yet? It was the Moses thing? Or was the Moses thing after Frenemies? Fuck, I can't remember anything. I really can't. Also, good to know it's possible to get auditory hallucinations when anxiety is high. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Like hearing maybe, okay, I guess that could make sense. I'm not saying it's bad, by the way. I just want to make sure if you're new to my audience, having a mental health crisis is never a reason to think you're a dangerous or a horrible person. I love Tim Walsh. He said it perfectly. Being mentally ill does not mean you're violent or a threat to other people. This stigma against mental health is not interesting to me. I think medical professionals should see their patients as interesting, thoughtful beings that want to get better. That's why they're paying you $145 every 45 minutes because they're trying to get better. So I just want to make it really clear that like none of the conversation we're having is meant to stigmatize Trisha or her experience. I think we should live in a world where we talk about this more and we should be normalizing the experiences that we're having because it's worldwide, it's global, and it's just... There needs to be so much more attention on it in the most like forgiving, open-minded way, you know? Like, yeah. You're not allowed to document yourself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was actually 
it's actually really nice. And I was like, oh, you this get is- up in the morning and <laughs> the birds are chirping and they're like, oh, I want to, but oh, I don't have a phone. How can I? document this beautiful yes. morning. Can I tell you like that would be me because there was so many fun things that happened in there and I just wanted to document it just for myself. Mm. And I was like, I'm like, no one's going to believe me or like, you know, it's just like, I don't know. It was such a, it was such a great experience to just be away. This was before I got into like meditation and stuff like that. It was just to like literally go away. And then, okay, hold on. There's something here too in chat. I wanted to say that the fact that we're talking about antidepressants, therapy, mental health in general, please know that when I was growing up in a bubble, even mentioning we're going to therapy was the biggest stigma in the whole world. And so I'm just proud of society for getting so far so quickly to the point that by the time I needed therapy, it was normalized enough for me to get the right kind at the right time to like make my life significantly better. And even now I'm looking at antidepressants for my fibromyalgia. And obviously even fibromyalgia, like who knows what this really is. Maybe I've got a tumor sitting in my belly right now. I don't know what's going on. All I know is that I am lucky to be alive now. At least they're, at least they're doing their like due diligence to check it out. But also we have a long way to go and getting people to recognize not everybody is lying or sensationalizing their symptoms. Real things are happening to me. And it's so funny. The irony is that I I fall into that category of person who's like tricked herself into thinking like, maybe I'm not in as much pain. And then I have to remind myself like, no, like you are in that much pain. And the fact like I read this thing on the autism test I was taking, it asked me a really interesting question. It asked me if I have ever hurt myself or been in pain in ways that I thought didn't hurt that much, but other people thought hurt a lot, i.e. like touching the stove. And I'm like, Yeah, but that's because I have high pain tolerance and like I'm a masochist and I have welder hands and nothing that hurts other people hurts me and wait. And I was like trying to figure out the significance of this question because I didn't know why they were asking it to me. And there's like, I don't know what it's about, but it's kind of like interesting that it even had to be a question because I was like, what does that matter? And now it makes me wonder. And I do struggle when doctors are like, what's your pain level? I'm like, compared to what? I don't know. What do you mean? Like it hurts. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. And also like I could suffer through this pain. You know how many women suffer the endometriosis until they die? Because like so many of us will convince ourselves like it's not that bad. Because like I don't want to be a pain unless it's like really a brain tumor in my brain. I don't want to cause too much trouble. And then you realize like you don't have to have a brain. But then some people go to the doctor because I I don't know. They Look, there's always going to be a person who isn't as sick as they think they are. And they make it a bigger deal than it is like a man with a cold. And then there's going to be a woman who never goes to the doctor, even though she has the most crazy endometriosis she's ever seen, and she's going to die, and they're not going to know until they open her up. And that's interesting to me. And the voices kind of, kind of stopped. I wasn't like talking to people anymore, but maybe more intrusive thoughts were coming in still. Um, I was supposed to get married that same year. So I do have a fiance at this point who's like doing all he can to help me, but he's mm-hmm. not, not someone. Not the person you're married to now. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is. Okay. We had just, we met in 2020. So this was like very early on. Um, Xanax, like this is 2020, right? So I was unhinged and he like did not want to date me rightfully so. I was going through a lot of stuff at the time, but he kind of helped me. That's how like, you know, I. Oh, Moses didn't want to date Trisha when they first started talking. I kind of like, got through it. Like he kind of helped me. To- is that a retelling of the story? Is that like a re... Mm, I don't know if it worked. Mm. Cause remember that Ethan was like, Hey, you better not date people outside of the show. And then Ethan or Moses slid into her DMS and they started dating behind the scenes. Is she retelling the story? Like Moses didn't want to date me at first, but okay. Maybe that's consistent. You guys are saying, I think that's consistent. Okay. 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 Okay best he could he didn't know about the xanax or anything like that so we got engaged i was like okay let me try and like clean it up a little stuff was going relatively well a little voices here and there um but then 2021 when i had the psychotic break i think he really didn't know how to like help me um other than like be there for me which did help into it in its in itself so when he stayed with me through my psychotic break when i like had to go check myself in and i heard noises and i'm like jumping off like into the pool, like naked from like the second floor of our house. Like he stuck by me, which I was like really shocked. Cause I was like, you know, who does that? And who should do that? By the way, I never say like, stay with someone if they're acting, you know, that way you don't have to do that. Um, cause I put him through so much, but he did. So I was like, all right, let me try and get myself better because we're about to get married. And I'm like, I want to like not embarrass him. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, he stayed with <laughs> She said on a podcast, 
And she said, I know people keep telling me this shouldn't be the reason I got better is my husband. But then she's still looking for answers. I really raise my eyebrow at externally motivated people. I feel like they have the worst relationships with themselves because they never know why they're doing anything. And if that person dies on them or isn't in their life, I feel like they crumble because they never had a relationship with themselves. You know, like you should be doing it for yourself because it's within your values. Like, you know how some people are like, oh, I had to cheat because my my relationship was deteriorating and that my partner was giving me the ick and I was so mad at them. So to get revenge, I cheated on them. Okay, but they're not the reason you cheated. You're the reason you cheated. Like you can blame other people or say you do it for other people or get better for other people, but it really has, in my mind, got to be about you and your values. And you're like, I'm gonna do this because it's the right thing to do. And I think maybe sometimes you practice by doing it for other people. Let's say a person who has a kid, like did they get their life together for the kid? But until they really do it for them, they're gonna feel alone in that circumstance. So many parents are miserable because they stepped up to be good parents, but they didn't step up to have a good relationship with themselves. We should work on having good relationships with ourselves. So I know Trisha is still on the healing journey because the way she talks about it is it's coming from the fact that she's married and probably has kids versus herself. I want her to I want her to have a great relationship with herself, but also it doesn't matter what I want. She's not obligated to do that. She's obligated to do whatever she needs to do in her life for her reasoning. With me and everyone was telling him, leave Trisha, leave Trisha. Like she's awful. She's the worst. And he stayed. So I was like, let me try and like work on myself like somehow. So I went back to DBT classes, but it was okay. the meditation that like really, what was it? I think I started with something very simple, either the power of now, or like the secret, you know, like the intro to spirituality. I was like, let me read something like this. And like, it kind of helped, right? Like the gratitude in the morning, like all those like simple techniques. I was the like- The power of now is yeah. one of my all time favorite books. Really? And I love so the good. audio book because he has this weird Austrian accent, Eckhart Tolle. So yeah. you listen to him like- you are only now in your place. You take a breath Chills. and that is all that exists. And there is no, your ego is an illusion. There is only yeah. the moment. And as soon as I tap into that, I'm like, ah, oh, like it's it, the, uh, it audio. releases everything. Yeah, I love yeah. that you know that because yeah, same. And I know that's like the, like the intro book, right? But I really recommend to anyone who's just like, I need help. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm spiraling. Like, I just feel like that puts you in such a perspective. I think the world in general is headed towards that direction, right? Is like being in the now and stuff. But I feel like for a while it wasn't like that. So there's there's a lot going on mm -hmm. right now. How did you get the pills away and decide to kind of like ground yourself into something more meaningful and more connected? I was, I'm thankful that I've never had like an addictive personality to like substances. Like I was so just So the kind substances of, just kind of came and go yeah. if they were around like, oh, mm -hmm. here's some pills, I'll take them. And yeah. this person's doing that and I'll do it. And, so this was like yeah. the time where I think my husband realized like I was taking pills. Cause again, he's never been that person. So he didn't know what it looks like to be on like Xanax. Like he just thought yeah. I was tired or something or like whatever. So I think at that point is when he took all the pills, like he saw all of them and realized, oh, it's not just like medications for when you're anxious or something like it's like, so he took all of them and just like threw them away. Right. So they're just not in the house. It's like food for me. I have like a food addiction too. Right. If the, if potato chips aren't in the house, I'm not going to eat them. If they're in the house, I'll eat the whole bag in like five minutes, you know? So mm -hmm. it was very much that it's very similar. Same thing with money. Same thing with everything. I used to just spend, I'd make $500,000 a month and spend $500,000 a month. Like I could just do that. What would you spend it on? Music videos. <laughs> I used to produce my own music videos and I would go to like Universal Studios back lot, you know, get fire department for like hoses going off. And I would, I did like, I recreated like D-Day, like in Long Beach. Like I had all these soldiers and blow ups. Like, yeah. So you're addicted to making your own music videos. Yeah. I spent I even... a lot of money, $10 million on it. What? Yeah, in like six years. <laughs> yeah. Are they good? Yeah, I think they're really good. People now think they're really iconic and I actually don't regret spending all my money on it. But it was before I even bought a house, I like spent money on this. I could have had right. like this... It's hard because they are iconic. They are. And I think that's why Trisha's in her heart of heart, like such a little neurodivergent, neurodivergent theater kid. You know what I mean? And so I, I do think they're like iconic and it's hard. It's, it's difficult. And that's why there's this conversation that always happens. Like do responsible people make good art? I personally don't believe in regret. But moving forward, I would prefer to be responsible than make great art. And I think 
that that's because that's where my joy is taking me. And I do think a lot of artists aren't always in their joy when they create, but sometimes are just depends on the relationship the artist is having to the art. Um, but I think that's so interesting. Also shout out to Abba and Preach who have made a million dollars making reaction videos to Fresh and Fit. Did you guys see that? We love to see a couple of kings win. That is so funny. A million dollars on 40 something videos on Fresh and Fit. You know, sometimes life be that good, you know? But my, again, my husband helped me with my finances. Like, oh, maybe just try to save some money. And I was like, okay. So same thing with pills. How did thing. you meet Moses, right? Oh. Yes, Moses. Oh, um, oh, oh. Um, we met on the DMs, yeah. Oh, right wow. before quarantine. So he was a fan. Um, <laughs> you married a fan. No, he wasn't a fan at all. It's like a complicated, it's complicated. But he's he's wonderful and great. And uh, Okay, girl. Okay. <laughs> um, we didn't have a perfect relationship at the beginning, but I, we do have a very perfect relationship now. It's wonderful. Um, but he really did like change my life. And as, as far as like, you know, this story is about 5% true, you know, about 5% true. Actually trying to help me better myself. Like, oh, let's try and save money. Let's, you know, try and take the pills mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And he really stood by me through all these messes. And I, no one's ever done that. My breakup before him was basically like jumped as soon as something like went wrong, which again, I totally understand because I was a little unhinged. So, um, so yeah, just, I, I didn't, I wasn't addicted to like pills necessarily. So that in the combination with literally for like the three months before our wedding, I wasn't working, I wasn't doing anything. So I was like, let me just literally sit in silence for like five hours a day. And I would do that. I would just sit, like, because I didn't know what meditation meant. So I was like, let me just, like, not think about anything. And that's a good place to start with meditation. Yeah. It mm -hmm. was great. Like, clearing yeah. your mind. Like, mm. I just didn't know what that was, you know? So I, and I went into all sort of religions, and people really came for me during this time because I was posting so much about all the religions I was learning about. So they're like, so what oh. did you learn? What religions did you study, and what did you learn? And how did you learn about them? really just kind of research books, going to temples, going to, you know, there's a really great Hare Krishna center in Venice. So I'd like go there and visit and I would kind of just like sit there because it's beautiful inside and I kind of sit and like absorb and, you know, they had the books and stuff that I read too. But every time I would post it, because, you know, I love posting about everything I'm doing. So I would post about, wow, I'm like learning this. I'm going to these temples. And everyone thought because they're on this cancellation train, they're like, Trisha's mocking this. Trisha's like appropriating culture, like a religion. But I really, one thing I learned about all religions, I would, it could be a part of her borderline as well that she like, or maybe just a part of her way she does her interests, but like she really does throw herself into it. She like learns language. She like does the hairstyle. She like wears the clothes. Maybe that it, I always saw Trisha is like partially not understanding why people are mad at her. But also I feel like when she likes something, she goes into it like an ADHD -er who just picked up a new craft. Like, Sometimes it feels like that's what Trisha suffered from the most was when she would do something like she would. Yeah, exactly. Bryson says she's always trying on identities. How borderline. And I relate to that. That is where I definitely relate to the borderline where like you're always trying it on. You're jumping into different bubbles. You're like, is this who I am? Is this who I am? Who's this who I am? Is this who I am? Is this who I am? And you're like trying to figure out like, is this who I am? And it's just it's hard to know who you are. And that's until I think you move inward. You get to know the real you. That's why I. I'm concerned when people are externally motivated because that's like your extroversion needs to be good, but your introspection needs to be better. When I consider myself religious, I just was trying to find something to be like a part of. I think everything, like all religions kind of say the same thing, right? Like there's a higher being. Amen, yeah. sister. This is, <laughs> this is the one of the thesis of Soul Boom. Yeah, okay, and, so you uh, get it. <laughs> you know, I'm a Baha'i and that's kind of a central. Wow. See, the irony of saying we're like the universe experiencing itself and then to identify with a label that's a construct, like I'm Baha'i, like that's so fascinating. Like that means you like that means you do identify with some sort of understanding of like the higher power or God. Like he's so in a two bubble, but it's like the two bubble of the spiritual bubble. But he thinks if everybody knew this, the world would be better in the same way that like any other bubble thinks that about anything. I, this is such an interesting bubble hop because like this is the spirituality bubble that I don't vibe with. But I, you know, it's nice to hop in, see it and then leave. But I can't live here. 
I can't live in a bubble where you identify with a philosophy system or like a religion or like a thing outside of yourself to some extent. Like, oh, so interesting. I'm fascinated. But it's cool to bubble hop into this. I mostly am curious on how Trisha relates to it, right? That's what I think is interesting. All right, let's see. And then the Baha'i faith is all this. religions uh, come from the same source. And uh, So then you believe in the source. Like, so he believes in God, which is like fine. Yes. Essentially the same, although it's easy to see uh, human-made differences. The, mm. At the core, they're very, very similar. But. Yeah, I feel like when people talk about manifesting, it's also like praying. But if you even go back True. to the original religion, like Wiccan, right? Like the pagans, they're using like the elements, the smoke, the fire, but it's doing all the same thing, right? Like you're all like, or even energy, right? When scientists are like, oh, the Big Bang. But it's like, people believe God. You know, it's like God, Big Bang, energy, source, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of the same, right? And people don't like when I say that because that can be whatever. But um, I think it's all similar. When you like, even like in Buddhism, like what, when you like, when you meditate, it's like science will call it like wise mind, right? Like therapy will be like, that's wise mind. But to me, it's like meditation. So I kind of learned that. And I really did study like everything. Um, I... And what drove this? Um, I honestly just like needed something. I was just like, I Googled one day, like literally like how to get my mind right. And I just read somewhere that someone's like, just go and sign, like just have no thoughts in your head at all. And I was like, well, thoughts are always running and consuming me. So right. let me try this. Um, so I started every morning still with meditation, but I would literally sit in my outside for like five hours and it... <laughs> And I would be on TikTok Live doing it, right? I'd just sit in silence. You streamed yourself having no thoughts. <laughs> but can I tell you, people were so mean. They would throw tomatoes at me because I was I was fully like just classic gif, classic Trisha gif. Closed <laughs> wait, eyes. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah. In in real life, like over the fence no. of your backyard, they throw <laughs> tomatoes at you. On TikTok Live, you can throw tomatoes at people. So there's clips I didn't of me. Know that, how that works? I don't. I didn't know either. They hit a button and and then tomatoes go. You actually have to pay money to throw tomatoes at someone. So I was actually getting coin, but I didn't know that. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> but there's a clip of me meditating that's like really viral. And at the time I was really like offended by it, but now it's kind of funny. And it's me like literally just, cause sometimes- It's so funny. We just posted it in the Discord. Two of us just posted it in the Discord. It's so funny. Okay, that's the part about life that is so interesting is like, okay, do you guys ever have this thought? If I overshare, people are gonna think my experience isn't real because they're gonna think I'm oversharing to be witnessed. But what if I'm oversharing because it's really interesting to me and I feel indifferent to it? But then if I meditate online, people are gonna be like, this isn't even real. Or if I go on a, a podcast and I talk about my life and like, you know, you're always wondering like, should I remain like mysterious and private so people know like it's real? Or should I just be open and be like, hey, I might die today, but also like, eh, like also about like what? It's like, you never know what do you share. And so sometimes I think Trisha just decides to like share it all, which I understand. I'm a relatively open content creator myself. Like I share a lot, not everything. Sometimes it feels like Trisha shared too much because she had no filter. But I think she also is so, I cannot tell if it's not an act, then she is missing some socializing understanding of people in some way, which is why a lot of people think she's autistic or even she thought she was autistic. Ultimately, whatever Trisha is, she certainly isn't uh, anyone but Trisha. Sometimes I would do just like vibrations, right? The, you know, all that stuff like that. I would just do vibrations just to see if I could feel something different. So I was doing that as I was doing yoga, as I was doing, you know, whatever. And I was like, well, let me just go on TikTok live because I'm not creating any other content. And then, yeah, people were throwing tomatoes at me. But um, but it helped. It helped me. People thought I was being funny. But still to this day, I really do start my morning off with, like, meditation when I can. Obviously, I have a three-month-old, so it's hard now. But sometimes she's in there with me meditating, you know. I'm trying to yeah. connect mm. your, you know, your path out of that darkness. And, like, I love this idea that you just Googled, <laughs> like, how to get your mind right. <laughs> yeah. Try and have no thoughts. I'm going to sit there for five hours. But, of course, because it's you. Yeah. <laughs> You've got we did a five hour silent meditation in the discord once it was cool we do meditation events sometimes it's not guided it's just to encourage you to sit there and we did a five hour event and then we did what was the longer one we did guys was it eight hours the five hour one was good i was really i had a lot of good moments in that one didn't check my phone barely got up to pee did tried really hard not to look at the screen 
Um, that was really fun. And like, yeah, it was 10 hours. Okay. We did 10 hours. Thank you. It's like, yeah, we did a long one. It was fun. Usually when we do meditation events now, we haven't done one in a long time, but if we do it now, it's like two hours just to give people like a, a re like a sit on your own. I just do silence during the day, certain pockets of the day. (sighs) And then I choose when to come in and out on meditation. But yeah, it's like, just to be silent, just to not look at your phone, to be like, just to be alone with yourself. What a gift. And what a gift, really. What a gift to be alone with yourself. Gotta like set up the phone and log in and put it on the tripod. <laughs> oh, it fell. And put the light on and like yeah. make sure your hair like, <laughs> you know, like. Sure, yeah. And then well, you have to. It motivated me to do it, you know? Right. Now I just do it and I don't really film it. <laughs> what would it be like for you to not live in the public eye for a mm-hmm. year? I always think about that because I also play the lottery every day and I always think, well, if tonight I win, it's like oh. $800 million. Dollars. You know, that's a decision. Like, if I want 800 million, I'm like, I would just disappear but my husband's like no you wouldn't he's like you would just build a bigger set you would just be on universal back lot like just paying people to come see your show like I would I would yeah I would still want to be in the I like to perform I like to like be creative you know I don't know maybe I just like being seen I have no idea actually if you want to get deep I'm not really sure but Mm. that year honestly it was just a google and that's why I kind of share my story because I'm not the typical like spiritual guru right but it did help me and I'm like well that is the biggest thing. Like obviously gratitude and obviously like just having your mind clear, like before you go to bed, like all that stuff like just helps because like answers just kind of come to you when you clear, right? If you overthink things, like I'm, I was constantly overthinking, oh my God, people are going to hate me if I put this out. Oh, people are going to judge me for my past. Like just all these thoughts were like consuming me. Hold on. What is the Buddhist bubble attached to the idea of non-attachment? Kind of. The Buddhist bubble is attached to the constructs it creates. Like the Buddha itself is like the construct it creates. The idea of enlightenment is a construct. Right. So to even think like I'm going to reach enlightenment, like what does that even mean? You know, before enlightenment, you chop wood and carry water. And after enlightenment, you chop wood and carry water, people. And almost like manifesting themselves. because They're just like, everyone hates me. I'm problematic. I'm this. And then the moment I started thinking like or not thinking rather, it just kind of like gave me clarity of like what I needed to do. And it kind of just guided me. And basically when I was like trying to get pregnant, like in my like late twenties, they're like, oh, your tubes are like, they're like scarred. So I was like, okay, I probably can't get pregnant and like never could for so long. So it was like 10 years. And then when my husband and I tried like, Ooh, great question. Sorry, Trisha. Hold on. Do you think people like Trisha still seeking wealth and the Kardashians posting on Snapchat for money is the same greed or something else? I think Trisha really is. I think Trisha, okay, the Kardashians are in a business, 1000% business. Everything they're doing is business, business, business. They are the Mr. Beast of celebrities, okay? It is business. First and foremost, this is about being the biggest, the greatest, the richest. Trisha wants to be interesting. Trisha wants an interesting life. Trisha wants to know who she is, I'm assuming. This is all me guessing. Trisha seems to be more like a person who's really trying to find herself and she's trying to use art to find herself and and wealth and other people and external validation. And she's trying to find herself. Kim Kardashian knows who she is. She's a moneymaker. Like Mr. Beast isn't trying to find himself. He's a moneymaker. Okay. It's different. And they're probably on the extremes in that way. But like everyone's always trying to have a relationship with themselves no matter where it goes. But I think Trisha is more authentic in her pursuit of life in some ways, but she also chose a bubble where she could be. She is really a great person to be on YouTube in many ways or social media. But I do question a lot of what Trisha does, right? I do think she does a lot of things now that I, for me personally, are like an indication. And she already said she's not healed, so it's not my business to say otherwise, but like that she isn't in the healthiest place. You know what, how I said, I have a podcast coming out about this. I think every generation breaks about 10% of a generational curse. Trisha broke a part of her generational curse, but didn't break the whole thing. And it's going to be up to her kids to continue the idea of breaking those generational curses that Trisha will give them. Just like we'll all pass down a generational curse to some capacity. There'll just be generational curses that you didn't break this time around. And I think Trisha did contribute heavily to breaking some of her family's generational curses. But I... 
I could probably predict some of the ones she's probably going to struggle with forever. And her kids are probably going to have a memoir about their mom because like she just falls into a particular category, but who knows? No one can predict the future. And that's why we check in with people to see where they're, where they are on the journey. Like who needs reality TV that's scripted when you got real people? This is so much more interesting, but I love my reality TV. Love is blind episodes coming out this week. Three months after we get married. And then like that next month, I was like, Da, 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 da. 